My name is Jocelyn Conley. I'm a doctor of physical therapy and I'm the owner of the Vagina Doc Physical Therapy and Wellness in Scottsdale, Arizona. I own a concierge physical therapy practice where I go to people's homes and I also have capability of providing treatment in the clinic. Um, and I figured that in this pandemic, what better time to put out resources for a lot of you that have been following me than now. Before I dive into this pilot episode, I just want to thank you all for reaching out to me the last several weeks. It's been awesome seeing that so many people have been getting value out of my posts on my personal page as well as my Facebook group. But there comes a time when I can't answer everyone. So part of this journey is creating a platform or a medium where I can answer a lot of your questions on a time through this essentially. So looking at, if anyone comes on, if you don't mind, say live. Good morning, Divya. Hope you're doing well. Um, so my episode today is called, I jumped off of a cliff and this is what happened. In sept it was September 13th, 2019. I left my full-time job at a, another private practice in Arizona and I didn't actually jump off of a cliff, but I consider that moment as me jumping off of a cliff. And it was literally the scariest, hardest, wildest months from September until just January that I have ever experienced in my life. And at the time going through it, I knew that I was going to survive and I believed in my purpose, I believed in my mission, but I, I, oh, I asked myself every single day, why am I doing this? It, it was, it was un, an unbelievable crash. That's the only way I can describe it. And looking, I, even going through it, I said, I am going to be so grateful for this experience. I'll see the silver lining. And I did throughout, throughout the process. But now, after meeting the people that I have met along the way, I am so grateful that I did it the way I did it. So some of you don't know really my story at all. Um, I graduated from physical therapy school, which is a doctorate program. And I went to Washington University in St. Louis, fabulous school. Uh, and while there, I basically went transformed as I discovered and fell in love with uh, pelvic health, pelvic and abdominal health physical therapy, which is a subspecialty in the physical therapy profession. Um, I've had the spectrum of pelvic floor dysfunction growing up as a female athlete and it was really hard to get help it was really hard to talk about it and through my journey in physical therapy school and becoming a patient being okay to tell my story I've seen how much facing that and being able to talk about it receive care has affected every other area of my life and so starting my second year of physical therapy school I started taking classes and reading and listening to everything that I could I probably would have put in the hours of two DPTs if I'm being completely honest and then when I started when I graduated I moved to Arizona thinking that if I got one of the residencies that I had applied for, I would take it. And so I studied for my board exam uh, at my cousin's in Scottsdale. Long story short, I did get the residency. However, I, I 
got offered a job and it was an opportunity to help develop a pelvic floor program and I really liked Scottsdale and didn't really like Tucson. And so here I am. I had that amazing opportunity to come into my own, kind of just like go through the weeds and not be, my hand was not held. I had to figure out a lot on my own and get help on my own rather than having a structured mentorship and that was really amazing. I learned a lot from a colleague of mine, Heidi Guru, and she works, uh, worked with me at my last place. And since then, I, in, or along that journey, I've also developed a specialty and, and an expertise in high level strength and conditioning and performance and have since applied that to uh, the pelvic health specialty. So enough about me um, in my story, but basically why it's important is as I treated, before I got into it, as I treated more in orthopedics and developed skills in orthopedics because, you know, school is one thing, but whenever you start treating people live, it's a whole, whole different ball game. But I realized that so many people had these persistent and chronic issues, specifically in women, that dated back to an, an abdominal procedure. Like let's say they had a major accident and they had to have open surgery or they even had a laparoscopic surgery. Or it was their, when they started having kids, they had baby one, five months later baby two, six months later, later baby three, or one woman may have had, uh, was pushing for several hours and then had an emergency C-section, or it led back to a physical or psychological or sexual trauma, and things kind of just all tumbled from there. And what I realized was if they were coming in for neck pain or they're coming in back for back pain, I could not help them unless I knew everything about that, about the pelvis and the abdominal wall. Because let's say the person that was verbally abused, which I didn't even mention, a lot of the tension that they were holding was in their abdomen, their pelvic floor. Um, or let's say I discovered down the road or initially that that person was sexually assaulted from child being a, a, a toddler, infant, child. That trauma doesn't just go away. So I knew, I knew that if I stayed in orthopedics or if I didn't go there and go there by asking about the pelvis and the abdominal wall, understanding about their surgeries, understanding how they, how these people were looking at their situation and rehabbing or healing, I realized that many people didn't go through the healing process and didn't get help. And their bodies, our bodies are really smart. We can push through, but there is going to be a point where your body punishes you for not taking care of it. Now, that aside, got, got into it, started doing it, and I, I'm going to tell you that when I started addressing those factors or those pieces, people got better almost always. If they didn't, there were other components part of the equation, and I mean, I treated a variety, treat a variety of people, so if you have comorbidities like metabolic disease, diabetes, heart disease, hypertension, all of those things, those add to the complexity of, of treating someone, um, as well as undiagnosed subclinical. So subclinical means if you had a test, it's not going to fall into the range of being treated with medications. And there is that question from our standpoint and other medical fields of even if it's a positive test, do we treat it? So for example, if someone has, if someone's seeing me for back pain and they have painful intercourse, but they don't care and they want, 
maybe they're not sexually active or they don't want to be. Do we even go there? Do we treat it? And, and so that, this becomes a lot bigger of a question. So I jumped off the bridge and I did not, I did a lot of personal development from an employee standpoint, but I did not do enough personal development as a business owner and an entrepreneur. And so I was not ready, but I mean, I've done a lot of hard stuff. I've lived in my car for a week. I've, I've ran a marathon after not running for a month. I've done so many hard things that I knew I could get through, but I didn't have the clients to, to sustain myself from a living perspective. So I got a PRN job and uh, basically I would go to people's homes and evaluate and treat them. And most of my clientele were older. And at first I was like, oh crap, I don't, I've always kind of steered away from treating geriatrics because I'm so intense, I just can't relate. But you know, you, you do what you can and you learn, you go back to the drawing board, like I had to go back to my resources and so on. And I fell in love with treating people in the different generations. So I've treated people that were over the age of 100, 90s, 80s, 70s, 60s, every generation. And the beauty of my job, or my PRN job, was that I got to spend more time with them. And there's something about going into someone else's homes that is so different than them coming to me. And I was, I just felt like I was part of people's families. And so I would hear the stories of my patients' lives. I've heard that I've, women have told me, you know, the ones that were in their 90s, they've been, they've been through a lot. And they've also experienced how the world has changed so much. I, my patient that was over 100, she experienced how segregation, uh, all the things with the wars, and I remember some of the things she would say, it was so cute, but she was so open to it as well, whereas not everyone in the older generations are open to the expansion of, or, or how our world has evolved. But some of the stories that I've heard are really amazing, like how their, her, the, the partnership between in this case, a man and a woman has been, they've been, they grew together. They're from a marriage standpoint, the husband has supported his wife and the wife was my patient at the time. And they had a good sexual relationship. They had a good partnership from a parental standpoint and they supported the growth of one another. And then I've heard some of the opposite. Poor communication. I've heard people being locked in closets, abused physically, forced to do things that even though you're in a partnership, consent is still important. It's still a thing. I've heard how women have been treated as they grew up. Now they're older and their experience just with, as in, in the workforce of how men had been treating them. Uh, I've heard about how women were, what their experiences were having children and that healing process or lack of care I've heard what they've been told about issues like urinary leakage, prolapse. I've heard everything. And what I can tell you, my biggest takeaway from treating every generation of women is they wish 
they had the resources that I had provided them or had educated them on from an early age. So I've seen the evolution of active women, non-active women, body conscious, like taking care of themselves, those that are not so body conscious, and I, I've seen what good, so some listened after childbirth, but I mean, it could have, could be better, but they at least did what they were supposed to do in terms of kegels, S depending on who guided them, it was, some were better, some were worse. I've been, I've seen those women who've been told that they needed, well, they've had surgery after surgery because the surgeries failed and then their mesh started eroding into their tissues and now that they are just going to the bathroom eight, ten times a night. Um, but even, so beside that component, besides their wish to know what they learn from me, is that they're take, they, those that were happy let go of control and also let go of control of things that they couldn't control, but then also they took responsibility for their own bodies. For example, in the medical field, they didn't just do what the doctor told them without making sure they understood, the, they truly had an informed consent. So informed consent meaning they knew the benefits, the alternative therapies, and the relative risks. They did their research on who, what, what provider was available to them. So focus on what you can control and do your own research. So that's, treating every generation of women has been such a learning opportunity to see, you know, this is how people evolve. But then the other cool thing is, I used, th this is probably unethical, but I did not, I told my colleagues I did treat people over certain ages, but I was like, there's not much I can do. That was early clinician Jocelyn talking. Now I'm more experienced clinician. I have had such amazing results in treating women above the age of 80 and into 90, and both from a manual therapy perspective and an exercise perspective. The hardest thing, I think, is teaching women how to contract their pelvic floor at above the age of 90, especially if they had major trauma during childbirth and it I almost consistently see it across the board after if, if if my patients over the age of 80 had traumatic delivery they don't have much pelvic, pelvic floor function so we have to uh, be creative um, it has to be collaborative so not one you typically after a certain age you're going to be seeing urologist potentially your gynecologist a pelvic floor physical therapist and your primary care and other people and uh, women need to start paying attention to their cardiovascular health because that certainly is one of those tipping points of symptoms versus not having symptoms. Uh, for a symptom being like you didn't go to the bathroom more than once a night after the age of 70 and now you're going five plus, t five plus times. I could go on and on, but I don't want to keep you on so long. Um, second thing. I want to talk about is, I kind of already mentioned this, is we all have direct and indirect traumas in our life, whether they're physical, whether they're psychological, and whether we even know them, we know about them or not. And if we don't deal with them, if we don't go through that healing process, they follow us. So. An example would be you broke your tailbone as a kid. You had, you know, you had pain for a while, but there's nothing people that you were told that you could do, which treatment would be seeing a pelvic PT, pelvic physical therapist or physios, physiotherapist, or an even, even an orthopedic therapist that has experience treating that uh, around the pelvis. Whether it's sexual abuse, whether it's an STD, 
Your tissues hold emotions, whether you are aware of it or not. And the more you numb, the more you take the stance of ignorance is bliss, the more those traumas build. And when you are okay seeking care, which is absolutely, absolutely key, like you cannot go into an office and say, fix me and not be engaged. I will not examine someone's pelvic floor region without them being fully present. If they check out, they're not ready. But once you are ready, understand that the longer you have the trauma, sometimes the longer it can take, depending on what those traumas are. But sometimes it's very quickly. So try not to take the stance of ignorance as bliss. Last thing I want to talk about is how, as individuals, we, or me, is I am the, I have to take responsibility of my body because at the end of the day, I'm the one that spends the most time with me. So even though you may not be a doctor, you may not be a, you may not ha have majored in a health science education. There comes a time where you have to take responsibility for your own learning, for your own care, and do your own research. I'm not telling you to Google it. I'm telling you to, if you're ready to get help, look up different providers. Is there information about them? Call the office, ask questions. If they don't have time to ask que answer your questions, that's a sign. We cannot blame, most of the time, we can't blame the universe or blame others for what happens to us. I know we want to. We're all, we all get to that point. Think, sometimes it's not fair. The healthy person that never smoked getting lung cancer. The young, the, the, the 19 year old guy that develops testicular cancer. No, no, fa no reason, rhyme or reason. But you cannot take the stance of no pain, no gain, or I'll, it'll, it'll resolve itself eventually, or you're the doctor, or it's your fault for things that happen to us. So there's a lot that those are the three main things I wanted to talk about. But the main thing that I wanted to, to say about, or I, the one reason why I wanted to start this show, even though I have a podcast, is there's a lot. I, the, my podcast is a purpose is to collaborate with other people in, that serve humans along the lines of pelvic and abdominal health. And so this was an opportunity for me to just dialogue and give you guys information. A lot of you just never even knew that this stuff existed because we can't really see it. And what we do see is either from a treatment perspective, coming from people that have money, like you see the uh, poise commercials. You don't see pelvic floor physical therapists put in commercials because we don't make anything, comparatively speaking. Uh, you see these surgeries, these mommy makeover surgeries, these tummy tucks, you see bladder slings, all these cosmetic surgeries, they have the capacity to put ads out and market. From a financial standpoint, we physical therapists and more conservative therapies those that offer conservative therapies, they, we don't, we don't have the, 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 the resources to, to market as, uh, as much. Second thing is that behavior change 
Andrew, hi. I can't wait to our interview tonight. Can't wait. So, you guys, if you don't know, I do have a podcast called Real Talk with the Pelvic Docs. Uh, tonight's episode that I am recording is going to be with a couple of uh, colleagues of mine. And we are going to talk about communication around intimacy with from a guy's per- perspective. So super excited about that. But anyways, talking about uh, how a lot of stuff that you find online are from people that can put the man py- power out. And then I said it's behavior change is hard. So uh, I will tell you up front that I won't... Sh- I am not for everyone. There's a lot of people out there that don't want to put in the time or the work or the, for ultimate healing. So they take shortcuts. But understand that you choose the tummy tuck over the, the rehab before and the work finding, the surgeon that can give you what you want from a functional perspective so you feel good then you can't get mad if you don't have pain. Now, it isn't fair whenever the the people offering the therapies don't tell you everything, but that's a whole other subject. But not enough people know who we are, and my mission is to give you that information. Uh, this is not a nothing. This is not meant to substitute for formal medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. This is just for entertainment and informational purposes only. So if something's going on, you got to go talk to someone, for uh, a professional, and not go by just what this is, what I tell you on here. Uh, so thank you for tuning in for to episode one. Just introduction to me, the show, and some of the lessons that I've taken. I am super excited to continue this this show and give you guys tips and advice on hot topics that people reach out to me for and what I see on the pages and so on. And um, if you want to hear something specifically, let me know. Have a wonderful Tuesday, and I will see you on Thursday at 7.30 a.m.